Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our daily learning, online Israel learning, with our amazing Alexander Musk High School in Israel teachers. This is a joint project between Jewish National Fund and Alexander Musk High School in Israel. And today, we are welcoming, welcoming for the first time uh, Reuven Spiro. Uh, Reuven earned his BA in linguistics, holds a graduate degree in international law and education, and has studied at Hebrew Union College and at the Pardes Institute for Jewish Studies in Jerusalem. Before joining the staff at AMHSI, Reuven was the director of Jewish education in Columbus, Ohio, and worked at Hebrew University and the College of Judea and Samaria in Ariel, and has been, a thank God for all of us, a part of our Alexander Moss High School in Israel teaching staff since 1994. Reuven Spiro, it is uh, really a, a pleasure to be learning with you today. The classroom is yours. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm really nervous because I'm not used to speaking in front of people. Um, you would think as a teacher that this, would, this wouldn't be an issue, but uh, it, seem, it seems to always be. If, you're, if, you're, if you grow up being nervous talking in front of people, I guess it never leaves you. You never get away, if you're, away from your insecurities. You just kind of like deal with them. So uh, this idea about um, having a class on um, showing how, uh, about how God runs the world was actually an idea I had for, for a book that um, I hope that one day I have the ability to write not because I have anything so original or deep uh, or new to say about the topic, but I just figured that um, any book that has a title like that um, <laughs> it's bound to sell. It doesn't matter really what you write. And uh, the fact that you all are here today um, learning with me, I guess, is a pretty good testament that that's, uh, that's probably true. Um, but the idea of how God runs the world and the idea of what we call a theodicy, where's God's justice in the world? And how do we see God's justice? How do we understand how, in fact, what's the, fa what's the fabric of our reality? How is it put together? And what is, um, how do we understand issues of, uh, of uh, right and wrong and good and evil and how things happen in the world? Um, there have been, of course, you know, a lot of books written on that. Probably the most notable was one by Rabbi Kushner on when bad things happen to good people. Um, and um, thank God, I don't have to uh, compete in knowledge with anybody who's ever written because I'm not going to really be saying, I'm telling you right now, I believe anything so, so terribly um, uh, earth shatteringly new, but I am going to rely upon the words of our sages to, um, uh, to, br to bring some of the questions, I think, into focus. And I want to say also that um, I think the period of time, the period of time we're living in, my friends, oops. Um, the period of time we're living in, uh, the time, the time of, this, of, of this virus, is, um, is, also, is also a challenge to us and uh, makes us wonder about how, well, here in Israel, we're going to have such a beautiful, wonderful winter rains and the Kinneret is higher than it's been since God knows when. And there is such amazing, uh, at this time of year, such amazing flowers and nature for us to enjoy and go out and appreciate. Um, and we're stuck, stuck at our homes, you know, um, really not able to do much of anything. Uh, and so one has to wonder about that. One has to wonder about the, um, the suffering that's being caused to so many families, and especially the, uh, the more elderly of our population who are more susceptible to, uh, to the dangers of, of this virus than and others. We worry about, of course, the, the generation of survivors who unfortunately have been affected by, the, by, the, by this virus um, so profoundly. And um, things like this make us wonder how, how are things put together? How do things make sense um, in the face of, of times exactly like these? And this was brought into, I think, um, a sharper focus for me when, uh, when, when Mordechai Cohen shared an article with us, uh, with, with the teachers that was written in, in Tablet Magazine. If you don't look in the Tablet Magazine, it's an online magazine, you certainly should. There are excellent, excellent articles on, uh, in Tablet Magazine about um, really the spectrum of Jewish life and thought and politics and culture. Um, this is um, really one of the more important Jewish magazines that's out there nowadays. And he forwarded an article by um, a professor by the name of uh, Shaul Magid from Bar Ilan University, uh, who was um, reacting to an article written by Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, talking about how this, uh, this virus is really going to have to make the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredi community in America and Israel and the world over to, uh, to take stock and, and perhaps not listen just to the words of their rabbis and not listen to the idea that um, 
davening in a minion or um, doing the mitzvah of honoring the dead by going to a funeral with hundreds or thousands of other people, uh, learning in yeshiva or learning, learning in school, th those things um, didn't save them, didn't prevent them from um, contracting the virus. And they were among the populations that were most profoundly affected by, by this virus. Uh, Rabbi Greenberg really believes that uh, this situation, this result, is going to force the ultra-Orthodox community to take stock in themselves and uh, redefine where, where they're going to look for the sources of truth. Um, Professor uh, Shagul Magid wrote a response to that that I thought in some ways was, uh, was very profound. And, and in fact, I want to start with a, um, a quote from, uh, from his article. As soon as I can figure out how to share here, here we go. You see this? Nod your heads? Yes? Okay, good. Okay. How Hashem Runs the World. That, that wasn't the end name of his article, okay? This is just a quote from his article. Um, and he says, the notion, excuse me, the notion of covenantal reciprocity, which is, that our actions are an answer to a divine command to doing mitzvot that will evoke divine mercy runs down the spine of the entire Jewish tradition. That is, that defines a lot of how we see the world working, all right? It doesn't suggest that mitzvot will always protect us as if they are some kind of magical formula. We know this is not the case. As the sages somewhat cynically teach, there are no rewards for mitzvot in this world. But this equation, is arguably the very operating system of Judaism. And in fact, you can actually see this even in places as, as well known to us as the Shema Yisrael. In the second paragraph of the Shema, two things that we don't normally connect are connected together. Um, it says, uh, if, if, you, uh, uh, if you listen to, to Hashem and do His commandments and love Him, then uh, you will get rain in your season and you, you will bring in your... Um, your, your, your produce and, uh, and, and, you and you shall eat and, and be satisfied. Um, we don't usually connect in our world behavior and weather, all right? We don't say that you guys in Chicago were real bad this past week, okay? Too many murders there, and so we're gonna send some really nasty weather down your way. We don't say that like you guys over in, uh, in, uh, in Florida were doing pretty well, and so we're gonna make sure that your, uh, your virus uh, is not as bad as it is in some other places. Um, we just don't connect things like behavior, doing misvote, and, uh, and physical phenomena. Physical phenomena are part of nature, and nature seems to be quite nonplussed by how we act. Nature goes the way na nature goes. Um, and what I want to do is start with a, with a Mishnah that talks about this very question about how the world is put together. Now, before we get to what to the Mishnah itself, I want to talk, you may already know what a Mishnah is and, and, and what the Talmud is and how, and how all these things are, are defined, but maybe not. And so I just want to spend like five really short minutes to talk about what a Mishnah is, what the Mishnah is, and, uh, and uh, the, um, the traditions of, of, our, of, of our nation. So this is, um, I couldn't find, uh, you think, you'd think I could find better clip art than this, right? Okay, but no, this is the only clip art I, I could find, and I'm not really uh, terribly talented at this. And this is uh, Har Sinai, Mount Sinai, all right? And when Moshe comes down from Mount Sinai, he doesn't bring just one Torah, okay? He brings two, according to tra tradition, okay? He brings the, the Torah Shebikhtav, the written Torah, which is our written tradition, and which includes the, the five books of Moses, the Torah. It includes the, the prophets, the Nevi'im, and it includes the Ketuvim, the writing, together what we call the, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And that's our written tradition, and that's our, connect, that's our connection to antiquity, that's our connection to our, to our history, um, to, uh, to the antiquity of, of, our, of, our, of our culture and beliefs. But in addition to the Torah Shebiktav, according to our tradition, he also brought down uh, something called the Torah Sheba al the Oral Torah. And um, it's very important that we have both of these things. The Oral Torah is not just there to explain the written Torah, but it's a whole body of learning and traditions of its own. And yes, it does explain a lot of things that we don't find uh, detailed in the written Torah, but um, 
I think probably the most important thing about the oral Torah is that it's oral. And it's, in fact, was forbidden to write it down for a long, long time. Um, and that allows it to be dynamic. That allows it to be interpretive. That allows it to, to respond to changes in society and changes in the world. And one could very easily say that the whole essence of what Judaism is lies in that tension between our connection to antiquity as expressed in the, in the Torah Shebiktav, the written Torah, and the Torah Shebaal Peh, the oral Torah. Now, the oral Torah actually comes in two flavors, if you want to call it like that, okay? The oral Torah is actually made of two different bodies of literature, traditions. One is called Midrash, and Midrash are um, creative editions of, uh, to, to the Tanakh itself. The things like Avraham's father was a peddler of, of idols back in the good old days in, uh, in Ur Kastim, which you don't find in the Torah. It's a, it's a midrash that the rabbis, the rabbis saw that the Torah starts talking about Avraham when he's 70 years old. And so they asked a very pertinent question, interesting question, what about his younger life? And that's where these interpretive and creative uh, ideas and stories come in that we call midrash, okay? Midrash are also, also tales of the sages from 2,000 years ago, all right? So that's one part of what the Torah Shabbat pay is. The other part is what we call halakha. And normally when we talk about halakha, we say that halakha is Jewish law. And um, in, in, in a way, I think that that's a probably a, a, that's a good um, summation of what halakha is. But if you look at the word, halakha comes from the Hebrew, uh, uh, the Hebrew root holech, which means uh, walking, okay? And it's very much in a sense, the way, the Jewish way of life, as defined by what we do and how, and how we do it. Um, and that also changes, adapts over time. And that's, again, one of the aspects of it being an oral Torah. What happens in about 200 CE, because of Roman oppressions and their desire to wipe out Judaism, is that they start killing a lot of rabbis. And the rabbis were the repository of the oral law. So to make sure the oral law was not lost entirely to our people, they began to write it down. And the person who was really responsible for organizing it, compiling it, and eventually publishing it, a very famous rabbi by the name of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, published the Mishnah in 200 CE. And, and the Mishnah is actually the first writing down of the, of the oral Torah, of the Halakha especially. Now he had a big challenge because he didn't want to write, write the, the Mishnah in such a language where it became frozen in time, where it would become just like the written law. And if we, if we, have, a, if we have a body of literature, religious literature that is not able to adapt, eventually it will become so irrelevant, so out of place in time, that the Judaism itself will die. The genius of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was in his ability to write the oral Torah in a way rather that rather instead of um, freezing it in time, and in fact added, it created a platform for the continued development of oral Torah. Oral Torah, Torah Shabbat Alpeh, is not a book. Torah Shabbat Alpeh is a process, and whenever Jews sit around and engage in learning, um, we're in fact creating Torah Shabbat Alpeh. So the Mishnah is the first writing down of the oral Torah, the Torah Shabbat Baal Peh, in about 200 CE. And then because of the genius of Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, uh, people will sit around in yeshivot, in, in, in study houses, and they will discuss the Mishnah for hundreds of years after that, all right? And the discussions on the Mishnah are called the Gemara. And if you are so uh, blessed to have a book which has both the Mishnah and the Gemara, you have a book that's called the Talmud. Um, now, you may have already known that, and it's just a very short review, but it's important to know that because we're about to study a piece of Gemara, a piece of Talmud, okay, a Mishnah and a piece of Gemara, and I wanted you to get a sense of where it comes from, because when we look at this, all right, um, we're going to see that, in fact, it's a, it's a layered text. You'll find, and here I'll bring it up, okay, you can see there are things in the green font, a little italicized, and those are teachings from the time of the Mishnah that was codified in 200 CE by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. And anything which is in the fairly standard blue font, that's actually, it came out black, I'm sorry, okay? But the fairly standard font, that is um, discussion of the Gemara, usually in the form of questions and answers. And anything which is in a black, black and bolded, is from the Tanakh, and it's usually brought in to back up an argument or a point, all right? So today what we're studying, we're going to be looking at 
is a little piece of Mishnah from uh, Kiddushin, which is a part of the mission that talks about how and when you, how you betroth young women. Uh, and this has nothing to do with betrothing young women, unfortunately. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting little Mishnah. And I have to tell you something. Um, maybe when, um, when Greg was talking about my, uh, my background, you noticed that uh, I studied HUC, which is the Reform Seminary. And uh, I come from myself from, from a, a reform background, really even more of an assimilated background where I didn't have much of a uh, Jewish um, background myself until uh, a bit later, uh, later in life. And when I started dealing with Jewish texts, it was a lot different than dealing with the legal text that I had been learning when I was learning international law. Classical Jewish texts oftentimes just hint at what they mean, and that's especially true when you're talking about the Mishnah. And sometimes you'll read a Mishnah like this Mishnah, and you'll say like, <laughs> what are they talking about? Okay. Are, they, are they serious about this? Okay. Um, but if you're patient with it and you look at it carefully and you think about, okay, well, so what are they really saying here? All right. What, what's, what's the issue that they're really addressing here? Sometimes it can open up an entire, an entire world of uh, interesting intellectual and philosophical thought. Okay. So here's the Mishnah. It goes like this, all right? One who does a single mitzvah is well rewarded, and their days are prolonged, and they inherit the land, the land of Israel, okay? And one who does not perform a single mitzvah is not well rewarded, their days are not prolonged, and they do not inherit the land. My friends, honestly, this is the type of Mishnah that makes me want to pull my hair out, all right? Really? This is what we're learning here. This is what the, the sages are telling us about how the world is put together. But look at it for a second, okay? What is it really telling us about our world? Maybe you want to... Do you want me to unmute some folks or they can chat? Yeah, unmute, and unmute some. Yeah, if you would. I think it's a good idea. If All right, people, so I'm going to um, mistake, please unmute them. Give me a second. Can you, can you uh, give me one sec? Uh, just have to, the perils of multiple screens. Give me one sec. I'm going to lock, lock our meeting. How do I do this? Can you do me a favor? Can you stop, stop sharing your screen for one sec? Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to allow folks to unmute themselves now at this point. Um, um, and I'm just going to lock the meeting. Okay. So everybody has the ability now to unmute themselves. Um, as we ask questions, I just ask that you do it judiciously, um, you know, and maybe even chat or raise your hand. So Ruben, if you want to go ahead and ask your question again, we can begin the conversation. All right. This mission that talks about um, if you do a single mitzvah, then um, your days are prolonged and it is good for you and you inherit the world. And if you don't do a single mitzvah, then you're not really well rewarded and your days are not prolonged and you do not inherit the land, okay? So what is it telling us about how, how the sages see the world is constructed? I guess I'll be brave and go ahead. In, in my own personal belief, I feel that if you do good, the reward is that in your heart you feel good and your world is better. But I don't, I don't believe that you do something good and you are absolutely rewarded in kind. I'm a healthcare person and I've seen too many people have illnesses and death who were good people and they didn't deserve. And, and I also am a reader of Rabbi Kushner's book. I don't think that you're punished. I, I just feel that it's within you. And I guess that's my concept of heaven too. If you've tried to live a good life, then you have a good afterlife. So how do you think the sages see it? Looking at this mission, what are the, what's that mission trying to tell us? I, I, that was from thousands of years ago. And I think they, they feel they were trying to maybe get people to behave ethically and do good things and trying to sort of like a carrot. If you do this, this will happen to you. But I don't, I don't believe that. 
Someone else? What kind of a world are the sages describing here? I mean, I think, look, I think the, the, the worldview of the sages is what Professor Magid was talking about, is our, the, the assumption that our very actions here in this world have an impact in, in, in sort of what takes place in this world and what takes place in the world to come. It, it's almost like the old if then statements in computers, right? Like if you do X, then Y, you know, whether or not, you know, that's my personal theology or our personal theology is a separate question that you'll, I know you're asking in our poll, but I think that's, you know, what the text and what the rabbinic worldview, at least according to this particular mission is laying out for us. Yeah, it seems pretty transactional. You do a mitzvah, you get a reward. You do a mitzvah, you get a reward. You don't do a mitzvah, you don't get a reward. So what, what they're positing here, what they're positing here is that there's a very direct connection. They see a very direct connection between what we do in this world and what we get in this world. I think you, I think you phrase it very well. Um, and that, I think, is a, it, I think that's a worthy question, okay? Is there a connection? Do we see a connection? Do you see a connection between what we do in this world and what we, and I'm not talking about if you study for a test, you're gonna get a better grade. You go to college, you're gonna get a, you're gonna get a better uh, a salary, a better job in the end, right? But rather on a, on a, a, on a personal level, on the, on the way that we lead our lives. If you do good, do you get good? Lynn was, was, uh, was raising that as something which, Lynn, if, I'm, if I understood you correctly, you don't always see in your life or you don't see in your life generally. Can I say something? Sure. Uh, um, okay, I think that it's a question of, uh, you know, a belief because uh, probably God uh, has other uh, traditions and uh, societies uh, wanted us to, to make sure that we follow the instructions that uh, make sure that we have a, a good society and healthy uh, society. This is one of uh, the things that I think. And it's uh, good to have them because otherwise uh, people would have done whatever they want. And there is probably there's no way to, to make sure that uh, we follow the instructions and uh, the rules that uh, helps us to help us to be normal uh, society. But I want to connect to what you said a few seconds ago. Uh, if you do a uh, mitzvah, you, you're gonna get uh, some price. Um, I think it's very childhood uh, thought. And, uh, <laughs> and I think we are all, uh, I can say by, uh, about myself that I was raised uh, with uh, this kind of uh, uh, philosophy and uh, thoughts. And I was very terrified while I, did something wrong and I was afraid that something will happen to me. Uh, and uh, I think it's normal to have fears. But nowadays, because of the Corona virus, uh, we, we ask them, we ask ourselves it's, if it's true to, to, to follow this, uh, this way of thinking. But I think if we, if we we uh, we put this uh, question like that. It's a lake of uh, of uh, emuna, of uh, belief in God, because we don't we don't really know what are the reasons that he decided to have this uh, corona. Maybe he uh, it can teach us a lot of things, and I don't really know, think that we have to hesitate about uh, our belief in God and uh, our way uh, of living. I'm sorry, what, what's your name? My name is Sima. Sima. Um, I, think that, I think what you said is very, is very profound, but I, the question I would ask you is that, you're right, if, if, if we look at this Mishnah on the level that we just read it, what we're seeing is, as you said, a very childish way of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, but the world that those sages lived in wasn't a childish world at all. They lived in a world that was difficult, that was oftentimes violent. Um, yeah. They were, they, I, I believe that the sages would be very careful not to try to describe a world 
which would be so um, profoundly different than the world that the other people in the generation are living in, because it would it would seem to me that they would be um, contradicting themselves. They would be putting themselves in a situation where um, people would simply not listen to their words seriously because it doesn't relate to the world as they see it. You know, Ruben, I, you know, I, I, it, it also seems to me that this theology or this outlook is, is one that people who are powerless, right? If we think about the context of the rabbinic times and sort of the, the, the nature by which there was oppression and you know, destruction around the Jewish community. It seems to me that this thinking gives sort of a powerless people power, right? If, if, if we don't have political power, if we don't have um, uh, personal agency in terms of the world in which we live, then this theological system gives power by saying that if we do X, Y will happen. Right. I know that I can't do X and, and get political sovereignty or agency in terms of the world in which we live, but here's an even more powerful understanding of what our actions can do. Um, How would people in their time understand, let's say, just take an example, um, the 10 greatest sages of their generation being publicly executed when these are people who are who are, who are doing the mitzvot, who are doing good, who are doing exactly what this Mishnah is telling us that we should do in order to reap the good, all right? And look what's happening to them. If that's what the sages are saying, then how, the, wouldn't the people around them look at that and say, hold on, this does not relate, this does not reflect any reality that I know. And that's a dangerous thing. Yeah, let's, really look at, let's, let's, see what, let's see what the Gemara says about this, okay? Because the... Um, if I have a faith about anything, is that I really believe that the sages are doing the best they can to help us understand the world that we live in. And in many ways, the world that we live in is not terribly different than the world that they live in. Okay, to the Gemara now, okay, the discussions, all right? So Rabbi Yehuda, he's gonna, he's gonna give us a little explanation here. He's gonna say, this is the meaning. One who does a single mitzvah in excess of their equally balanced merits and sins is well rewarded. And it says, though they had fulfilled the whole Torah. Yeah, the Mishnah is really, really foggy there. If you do a single mitzvah, you're well rewarded, okay? But how does that work? Well, Rabbi Yehuda says what's really being said here is that as the, like we're coming in on Yom Kippur and we're, we're, there's a balance that all of our sins are on one side, all of our mitzvahs are on the other side. And if you just do like one more mitzvah, okay? So you will push that side down and everything will be good for you for the coming year. Please God, please God, please God, okay? That's what Rabbi Yehuda is saying. One who does a single mitzvah in excess of their equally balanced merits and sins is well rewarded. And it says if they had fulfilled the entire Torah, all right? And again, if you're saying that this is a childish way of looking at the world, perhaps it is. But let's see how the sages deal with that. But is it true? And I love it when they start that way because they're so passionate about trying to understand what's true about our world. But is it true that one who performs a single mitzvah in excess of their equally balanced merits and sins is rewarded? But the following teaching contradicts it. This is how the Talmud works. It'll bring a teaching in, then it will smash it together with another teaching with, which contradicts it. Now listen to this because if you don't pay attention here, well, you're just not gonna believe what you're reading, okay? One whose merits outweigh their sins. Okay, sounds good, right? One whose merits outweigh their sins is punished. And it's as though they had burnt the whole Torah, not omitting even a single letter. While one whose sins outweigh their merits is rewarded. And they are treated as though they had fulfilled the entire Torah, not omitting even a single letter. What are they talking about here? Yes, okay, they're positing that there's a connection between what you do and what you get, but what? Do we have to argue with that? <laughs> yeah, that's what, that was a question mark on the, on, the, on the end of that, but what, okay, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's giving us a it's giving us a situation where you would think you're 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 
your mitzvahs, your mitzvot outweigh your sins. But instead of being rewarded, you're punished as though you had burnt the entire Torah. And a person mm -hmm. whose, whose sins outweigh their, their, their mitzvot is being rewarded as though they had fulfilled the entire Torah. Is, does the world work like that? Yeah? It's possible that they... Um that they're just like recalling um, the, the students are just like they are now, like the, the kid who sits in the front of class and gets every answer right and is a little like, like a, you know, you know, like teacher's pet is, is, is not the one to be rewarded, but the one who struggles and works hard and studies hard, he's to be recorded, he's, he's to be rewarded. I like that. What you're saying is that the people who are doing good anyway don't need the reward. The ones who need the reward are the ones who are struggling. And that's very, I've never, I've never heard that uh, way of looking at it, but I really like that, Rick. Anyone else, is this, does this reflect the way, does this, does this sometimes reflect what the world looks like? If you believe, if you believe in that, so it works like that. <laughs> yeah. So how do we understand it? And uh, the, the sages understand it by saying, um, that the first thing he says, Abaye says that the Mishnah means the festive day and an evil day are prepared for each, all right? So what is that? It took a long time, years, to understand what's being said here, and I asked a lot of different rabbis, and what it seems to mean is that, listen, a per there's a person who does bad in this world, right? But do they also do some good? They also do some good. So what God does, he rewards them for the little bit of good they do in this world, but in the next world, my friends, things are going to get a little toasty, all right? Well, also, the person who does good in this world, okay, does he also do bad? Of course, everybody does bad. So what God does, Hashem does, is that he punishes them for the little bit of bad in this world, but in the next world, my friends, it is smooth sailing, all right? So, but, all, but that kind of a, that kind of a, um, a solution presupposes what? Okay. Uh, repeat the question. That kind of an answer, okay? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Presupposes that one believes in an afterlife. That everything's going to be said. And, and I'd like to do, okay, Greg, we're to that moment. We're going to take a poll right here, right now, okay? And the question is this this world is full of injustice. I mean, you can't get around it. This world is really full of injustice. The question is that do you have faith? Do you have a belief that in the next world, however you believe what the next world is, okay, however you define it, okay, is there a, is there a, a next world? Okay, in which the injustices of this world are put right, or do you really reject that belief? Do you not do you not identify with that belief? Okay, and we're going to have a poll, anonymous poll. I'm typing it in as we speak. All right. Uh, hold on. Actually, Ruben, we do me a favor. Can you cut and paste it into the chat so I can cut and paste it? Is that all right? I do you have it pre-typed out or no? Like I put it in the chat for everybody. I yeah, then I'll cut and paste it into a poll. All right. I would like to say something. I think it's, um, you know, you can't understand the Mishnah or the Gemara without understanding uh, psycho the psychology of uh, per, uh, of a human being. Uh, and uh, maybe they didn't, uh, maybe when uh, the time that they wrote those things, uh, they did uh, believe that uh, one mitzvah can... Uh, can, can make you sure can make sure that you are going to be in heaven but now you know well nowadays the, the world is very complicated and uh, we understand as the time go by uh, uh, goes by that uh, not everything is uh, white and uh, and black and uh, even though it's written in the Mishnah and I don't hesitate that they, they did believe that I don't really think that everyone can can uh, uh, fulfill uh, those uh, directions. It's very hard to understand this. Uh, and, um, you know, a, a lot of times, a lot of uh, people doesn't uh, make all the mitzvot and they have a very good life and they continue to, to live helpfully and they, are, um, they have nice uh, life. And uh, from the other hand, uh, we hear about people who died because of the coronavirus or uh, other things, uh, although they they uh, try to be the best they they are, so we can't compare with 
we can i don't really think that we should compare between one and in a, another we can't uh, you can't understand everything that uh, so I, I, I understand what you're saying, and what I would ask you to do... I'm sorry, my English is not so, so perfect that you well, yours... Uh, uh, yours? Yours? <laughs> it's, it's fine, okay? Um, um, hold off on that until we see exactly... Because the sages are not going to... The sages really are concerned about what's true, and their eyes are open. They're people who live in the, in, in the world, and they're living in a world, as I said before, which is a, a world which is, which is not easy, which is very complex, uh, which is very violent in which a lot of evil happens to good people. And I don't, yeah. think that they, I don't think that they're able to ignore it and just say, well, you know, um, if I do a mitzvah, I'll be rewarded. And why should I worry about anything else? We'll, we'll see, okay? Well, that's, why, I, I don't, that's why I start with this Mishnah, because that's exactly what it seems like this Mishnah is saying, all right? But when you look at what they're actually discussing, they're going to take it, they're going to take it beyond that. Ruben, I'm not sure if the, if the television show The Good Place has made it to Israel yet. But there was a show on TV that just ended, I think, after five seasons that my family and I watched, including our oldest two children, called The Good Place. And it essentially, the entire uh, show is essentially this question. Right? Really? First, yeah, it is. And I would encourage anybody who's seen it. It is essentially about the afterlife. Um, and essentially, the question is, you know, you acquire points in the world you live in. And based on, you know, how many points, quote unquote, you acquire, you go to either the good place or the bad place. And it is essentially five seasons or four seasons, forget how many seasons, working out the question of the injustice or justice of that particular system. And without giving the show away, um, I would encourage everybody uh, to watch it. It's, it's, it's hilarious um, and well done. And I, you know, and, um, and I think one of the smartest shows on television probably in a long time. And, and by the way, just by, I don't know, Ruben, Ruben, if you're able to see the answers, but we've got 12 respondents, eight say yes, four say no. And, and I will sort of, uh, when we were creating the poll in the beginning of the class, I asked Ruben, can we have a third? And his answer as a good teacher was no, I want people to choose. Um, so as a good teacher is making us do really think hard. So um, I would encourage you to leave the poll open to, to make that choice um, and, and make us think. I will say that you guys are, by and large, a much more um, faithful class than any group of, of uh, high school students I've, I've had. Uh, most of the high school students are overwhelmingly, no, I don't believe in this. And uh, there's always a few, though, that, uh, that, that do. And I, fi I, find this very, I find this very interesting. One of the reasons I did this, because I wanted to see um, how it would be different than asking a, a high school class. It does remind me of a, of, of a story, though, about an old man and a young boy who are sitting on a park bench. And, and the old man says to the young boy, you know, I really don't believe in reincarnation. And the young boy looks at him and says, you know, I felt the same way, I I felt the same way when I was your age. You all are laughing, right? Okay. Um, very interesting. Okay, let's see, what, let's see how the sages take, take, uh, deal with this problem, all right? We're going back to share a screen and looking at the Gemara, okay? And we left it with, where it says, Nabahe said our Mishnah means there's a festive day and an evil day that are prepared. In other words, that things will be put right in the next world. Rava said, this agrees with Rabbi Jacob. And Rabbi Jacob said, and this is something that Shul Magid quoted earlier, that there's no reward for performing mitzvot in this world. In other words, there's an absolute disconnect between what we do in this world and what we get. There's no connection at all. For it was taught that Rabbi Jacob said, that's a very radical thing to say, all right? For it was taught that Rabbi Jacob said, there's not a single mitzvah in the Torah whose reward is stated along with it which is not dependent upon the resurrection of the dead. For instance, in connection with the mitzvah of honoring one's parents, and in the Torah, there is no more difficult mitzvah to, 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 uh, to keep than honoring one's parents, okay? In connection with the mitzvah of honoring one's parents, it said right there next to it that your day shall be prolonged and it shall go well with you. And in connection with sending away the mother bird, that's just if you're, if you're taking eggs from a nest, you're commanded in the Torah, black and white, written right there, that you have to chase away the mother bird first before you take the eggs. Now, since that's something which is going to happen anyway, that's seen as the easiest mitzvah in the Torah, all right? So it says 
And in connection with sending away the mother bird, it says the same thing, that it may be well with you and that it may prolong your days. Now, it's gonna give us a story. There's a guy, a father, he woke up late. He didn't get his breakfast. He's walking with his son along a path and they're walking along and the father's hungry and he looks up in the tree and he sees a nest, okay? Where there's a mother bird sitting on eggs and he says to his son, climb this ladder and fetch me some eggs. And so the kid gets the ladder, all right? And climbs up the ladder and sends away the mother bird, okay? To get eggs for his father to make an, an omelet. How happy this child is, all right? Because he's fulfilling both mitzvot at the same time. He is both honoring his father and he's sending away the mother bird. Both mitzvot where it says that your days will be prolonged and it will be well with you. And what happens to him? Gavalt. On descending, he falls and is killed. All right? So where is his happiness? And where is his length of days? Now, let me ask you this question. Can the world work like this? Is this the world you recognize? I want to see your faces, okay? Is this, is this, is, you don't, you don't, Daniel, you don't see a world like this? It can't happen? It could definitely happen. I just don't see it happen all that often. <sighs> but I live in LA, we don't have a lot of trees, so it makes it, you know, <laughs> more complicated. That might be it, okay? But that kind of thing where someone is doing well, someone is keeping mitzvot, all right, and ends up with the short end of the stick. Look at all the people that, um, that we see on the nightly news that have been um, affected by COVID-19 and have passed away. And you see these amazing stories of these people who are, you know, worked in their communities and teachers and, and, and uh, first aid workers and, and all these people who have done all this good stuff and then, get affected and pass away because of the virus. So, you know, it goes back to the, the to, um, to why good things happen to, bad things happen to good people. There's no guarantees, unfortunately. And what, what I'm, and what I like about this is that in fact, the rabbis aren't ignoring that. The rabbis are saying, yes, this is the kind of world we live in, all right? And Rabbi Jacob is saying, that the only way we can understand this is by understanding that in the next world, this boy is going to get the ultimate reward because of his deeds here, all right? Look at what they say. So you must understand that when it says it may be well with you, refers to the day which is totally good, and that your days will be prolonged refers to the day which is forever long, i.e., the next world, all right? And so he's saying that all of this is put right in the next world. And so here's where, Sima, you might say that the rabbis say, they put this to bed, okay? They say, yes, we have a solution to this problem. It's not a solution that maybe I relate to. It's a solution that maybe makes more sense 2,000 years ago. But here we have a solution. This world sometimes is like that. It's, it, it's twisted, all right? But we have a solution, and the solution is everything gets put right in the next world. But look at what the rabbis do. They're not happy with this, okay? First thing is, well, maybe things like that can't truly happen. Maybe they live in L.A., okay? No. Nope. Rabbi Jacob saw it happen. Then, well, maybe the child was thinking about a sin. Come on. The Holy One, blessed be he, doesn't equate a thought with a deed. Uh, and maybe he was thinking about, about idolatry, which is a sin of thought. Well, this is the, precisely the point. How is it that the performance of such important mitzvot doesn't protect him from such thoughts? That's exactly like what? Some people would say that's exactly like the Haredi community who says that doing mitzvot and learning Torah protects us from getting sick from the virus. Reuven, it, it reminded me too of an interview of a woman on her way to a church in Cincinnati um, and on CNN and was asked, you know, why are you attending services? And her, her basic answer was, you know, God will provide, you know, we're, you know, we're bathed in faith, we're bathed in, 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 in belief in Christ. And it, it, 
you know, as, as you're describing, you know, the Haredim saying, you know, somebody who studies Torah cannot be harmed. It seems to me it's the same kind of theology. It's the same kind of understanding of, of this Mishnah, just one from a very obviously Jewish perspective, another from a Christological perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why I, want, that's why I want to bring us back once again to Sh uh, Shaul Magid and what he and, and what he says. Okay, back to Shaul Magid. Rabbi Yisak Ginsburg writes: Magic claims that through certain words or actions, in this case, religious faith and behavior, God is compelled to do what the practitioner wants. But the Torah treats magic as abhorrent. This is true, but not quite an issue with the Haredim. When one says that Torah study protects the Jew, he's not saying that it compels God to protect them from harm. It rather suggests that doing Hashem's will serves as a strengthening covenantal bond between Hashem and Yisrael that merits divine protection. Consider that Jews often recite Tehillim, Psalms, in times of distress or danger. Is it just to calm our nerves, or do we believe... Or, can it, or, can it, or do we believe that it can be, in some real way, eff efficacious? If it's the latter, is that magic? I don't think that Shul Magid is saying it's magic. What he's saying is that, is that it, is, it is stressing the relationship between Jews and Hashem, and it might not change anything. It's not magic. We're not forcing Hashem to do anything. Rather, we're trying to, to create a bond which will, which will stand up, even if things don't go the way we want them to go. Look at what the sages say here, okay? Didn't Rabbi Eliezer say that those who are involved in performance of a mitzvah are never harmed? Like when you go to Israel or to America, your aunt gives you a dollar so the plane doesn't fall down, okay? This is true. But maybe it's only so on the way to performing a mitzvah and not on the way back, like the kid was on the way back. Rabbi Eliezer says, nope, those who are involved in performance of a mitzvah are never harmed either when going or returning. So how do they solve it? Catch this, okay? It was a rickety ladder. It was a rickety ladder, okay? So that injury was likely. And when injury is likely, one must not rely upon miracles. For it is written, as Shmuel said, how can I go? If Shaul hears it, he will tell me, if he will kill me. It's like when Hashem tells Shmuel to go uh, anoint David to be king. Shaul is already king, is still king, and if Shaul hears that Shmuel is going to do this, even at God's command, he will kill Shmuel. The point here is that it was a rickety ladder, so that injury was likely, then when injury is likely, one must not rely upon a miracle, okay? What you're saying is that um, it doesn't change nature. The forces of gravity still work. You could be doing the two most important mitzvot in the Torah, but gravity will still work. It doesn't, it doesn't, you can't rely upon a miracle. Now, I think that the language that they're using here is also very, is, is very important. You can't rely upon a miracle. You probably have things in your life. I certainly have things in my life that I could point to and say, you know something, what happened here was something which is so far beyond statistical possibility, probability, that what happened here was really a miracle. I cannot explain what is happening here in any other case except for the fact that something here, something happened here which was extraordinary that I personally can't explain. And it doesn't matter whether you're, you're religious or non-religious, we have these things in our lives that happen sometimes that are simply difficult to explain by plain old uh, cut and dried statistics. Um, the problem is that, it's that it, we're still left with with the kid falling off the ladder on the ground, laying there, dead, after having known those two, those two mitzvot. So how do we understand, so in a larger perspective, what's happening here? And I, I would like to uh, more or less end up with um, our two stories, okay? One story that uh, is, I'm sure is a very famous, famous midrash, but I'm embarrassed to say that the only place I've been able to find it is in a book called The Once and Future King, which is the stories of King Arthur, uh, written by T.H. White. And I've looked here, hither and yon, and if someone here knows where this uh, midrash comes from, I would love to know. But it's a midrash I think is very important for what we're learning, all right? The midrash goes like this. Um, I think it's Rabbi, uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Hoshua 
is walking in the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, and he comes across Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet, who's already dead for several hundred years. He was probably coming from somebody's Seder after he had some wine, all right? Um, or from a, bar, from, from a Brit Milah. Um, and so Rabbi Hoshua says, can I walk with you? And Eliyahu says, sure, you can walk with me, but like, uh, don't say anything uh, stupid, okay? And Rabbi Hoshua says, well, yeah, I'll try to, okay? So try not to, okay? So they're walking all day long, and towards the evening, they get to this little bitty village. And at the edge of this little, little, little bitty village, there's, there's a, a house, a hut, okay, with a light on. And, and Eliyahu goes to, the, to that hut, and he knocks on the door. And a man answers the door and says, yes, can I help you? And Eliyahu says, yes, we're travelers. We're looking for hachnes atorukim, for, for hospitality for strangers. All right? can, you, can you give us hospitality tonight? And the man said, well, you, you sure picked the wrong place to come to. Of course, yes, of course, come in, okay? And, but you have to understand this. Me and my wife and our three kids, and we sleep on the straw on the floor. We have nothing. We have a cow out back that gives us milk and butter and cheese. That's all we have, and you're welcome to the best of what we have. But you have to know that's what we have. So Eliyahu and Rabbi Yehoshua stayed there that night, and they had the best hospitality that that family could give them. They woke up the next morning, and the cow was dead. Their only source of Parnassah, the cow was dead. Rabbi Yehoshua was outraged, but he said he wouldn't say anything, so he didn't. So they walk on that day, and towards evening, they come towards a, a, a large city. In the middle of the city is this beautiful mansion. And Eliyahu goes and knocks on the door. And this big guy comes in and says, yeah, what do you want? And Eliyahu says, we're travelers and we need hospitality. And the guy says, I don't believe in hospitality. Look, I don't care about you. I don't like travelers. If you want to stay in the barn, stay in my barn. So that night, Eliyahu and Rabbi Yoshua stayed in the rich guy's barn. And they ate scraps off the table. And that was the hospitality they had for that night. In the morning... Eliyahu goes back to the door, knocks on the door, and the guy comes to the door and says, yeah, you guys still here? What do you want? Eliyahu said, I wanted to thank you for your hospitality. And while we were in your barn last night, I noticed that the roof of your barn is sagging and about to fall in. You really should prop it up, okay? And the guy just like slams the door on them. At this point, Rabbi Yahushua can't, can't withhold himself anymore. He says, Eliyahu, what's going on here? This is that poor family gave us the best hospitality they could give us, and the guy's cow died? And this guy, this yutz, okay, gave us nothing. He ate scrap from his table, and you tell him to repair his roof? Where is the justice in this world? And Eliyahu said, I told you not to run off at the mouth, and there you go. Okay, so like the night we stayed with the poor family, okay? You know, his wife was actually supposed to die. But because of the mitzvah that they did, Hashem took the cow instead. And this guy, this yutz, who did nothing for us, who was awful to us, okay? If his roof falls in, he'll have to redig his foundation wall. And if he redigs his foundation wall, he'll find a treasure that's buried there. And he doesn't deserve it, and now he'll never find it. So don't say there's no justice in the world. Rather say, there's justice in the world, and I don't understand it. What do you think about that story? Think about it. What do you think about that story? I feel like you can make anything fit your belief system. You know, I, like you, I mean, that's the whole thing. Yeah. If you don't believe in it, you could say there's no justice. If, if you want to believe that there will be justice in the afterlife, woohoo, it makes you feel good to do mitzvot. But we're never going to know. And so whatever you want your belief system to be, you could make it fit. Beautiful. Yes, Rick. Yeah, I, I, I um, <clears throat> I just think that that uh, forget about the means vote thing. I think that we can't know God's plan. No matter what, we can we can try to create things around it to make us think we know God's plan, but we cannot know God's plan. And and uh, and I, I gained that insight from the Book of Job, as well as uh, as well as. My father, who is a really great guy and a great dentist, contracting like something like Alzheimer's the day after he retired, that 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 was ten years of hell. And 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 um and I, I, the initial the initial um you know in, impact was like I'm angry I'm angry I'm angry and then I was like what the hell am I angry at you know like 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 I, I'm angry because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that this would happen to this good man. But the fact is, is that there is no sense. 
We don't know what sense is. We don't know what the plan is. We can't. That's why God is God. You have faith in the plan. That's very interesting. It's actually, that's actually the two major ways of looking at this story. I think what a person has to say is that what's the difference between a, a, a what's the difference between the way a world looks, okay, in a world that you don't know what justice is, and a world in which there is no justice? Those two worlds look exactly the same. The world in which we don't understand what justice is, and the world in which there really is no justice, those are two world, those are two worlds that look exactly the same. The only difference is, is in how we interpret the world, how we see the world, what we're looking for, what we're looking at, and how we, and, and how we interpret it. And I know that when you say interpretation, well, you just say, well, that's just an interpretation. It's not just an interpretation. Interpretations have significance. Interpretations create reality, my friends, okay? Don't go, I, mean, I don't think a person should ever, ever downplay the importance of what interpretations are. Interpretations create realities. Oh, and I'm going to end with this one story because I, I love this story so much. And it's uh, a story of um, one of my favorite people of the last century, uh, the psychoanalyst Viktor Frankl, um, who um, uh, spent some time in Auschwitz. He was in Vienna and uh, with his wife in 1938. And his parents were there also. And they were waiting for visas to come to America. Now, there was a very good chance that Viktor Frankl and his wife would get visas to come to America because he was already famous and he was young and, uh, and they would probably get visas to go to America. But the chance for his parents to get visas was very, very slim. And he had talked to his parents about like, what, what, what would happen if, if Viktor Frankl and his wife got visas, but his parents didn't get visas, what would they do? And uh, his parents said, listen, you've got to go. You've got to go. You've got to save yourself and your wife. You've got to leave Austria. Victor Frankl wasn't so sure about that. So the day came when Victor Frankl and his wife got visas to go to America. And his parents didn't. So he went to his parents' house to talk with his father about what should be done. He knocks on the door. His mom goes upstairs to get his dad. He sits down in this absolutely immaculate, spotless uh, Viennese living room, okay? And he notices something he hadn't seen before. On the coffee table, there was this chunk of rock, which didn't seem like it belonged to anything. He couldn't figure it out. And his father came down and he said, Abba, what's this piece of rock doing on the coffee table? And his father said, ah, so you remember when the Nazis came into Vienna, they dynamited the, the Beit Knesset. And I went there to see if there was anything I could save. And if you remember, there was a big Ten Commandments, a sales de brot, over the door of the Beit Knesset. And so I brought a piece of it home to, to preserve it. And Viktor Frankl's looking at it and he says that there's a Hebrew letter here. What's this all about? And his father said, um, all, the different, all the different Ten Commandments are symbolized by the first letter, by one, by one letter, the first letter of the commandment. And Viktor Frankl says, so which, which commandment is symbolized by this letter? No. You should honor your father and your mother. So he stayed in Vienna and took care of his parents. And together they were, George Frankl survived. His wife survived until the liberation and died a day or two later. His parents, of course, did not survive. They were murdered there. Um, but the interesting thing to me is this, all right? He didn't feel that God was telling him to do something. He wasn't a religious Jew in that sense. He felt that life was telling him something, okay? Life was telling him to honor his parents, but he didn't need to interpret that the way he did. He could just as easily interpret that as doing what? He just throws them away. Huh? Okay. How would I find out who they are? How could he have interpreted that commandment? He could have, he could have respected them by leaving. Right. Exactly. I was going to say the same thing listened. by leaving and carrying on the family name. Exactly. He could have listened to his father. His father says, you should go. He should have listened. So honoring his parents could have easily been 
listening to his parents and taking his wife and going to America. But that's not how we interpreted it. Life gave him a text. The text was honor your parents. The way he understood and interpreted that text was that he should stay and take care of his parents. And in doing so, his interpretation created a reality. Right? We have this large text out here called the world. Right? Each of us reads the world in a different way. We come to a different interpretation of what the world means. Maybe the world means that everything is random out there and there's no justice and there's no way of understanding where good and evil lives in the world. It's just the way the world is, and we have to accept it or reject it as it is. Or we can find meaning in the world as well. Both of those are interpretations, and perhaps even legitimate interpretations. Every interpretation of a text creates a text of its own. And I think what that story is telling me, and what this mission is telling me, is that you can live in a world in which you are doing mitzvot, and reaping some kind of benefit, whether it's for yourself, whether it's for somebody else, whether you're simply increasing the, the, the good in the world, by being as good a person as you can be. Or you can be living in a world which is, which is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. A world of no goodness whatsoever. And um, I think that's, just, uh, that's the story. I, I, I didn't actually uh, explain to you in 45 minutes how God runs the world. But I, I did give you, I think, um, what, I th what I think is one of the best takes that, the, that our sages has on that. And um, a teaching that has personally affected me very deeply. Thank you for your uh, for your patience. <laughs>